I want a two, a one, two, three, four. I found my thrill on Blueberry Hill. Yes, I'm fully aware that I can't sing worth beep, but hey, blueberry wine, let's make some. <laughs> We've made blueberry things in the past, but today we're gonna make blueberry wine. But I'm going to be using an opened packet of yeast. Right now, this is Schrodinger's yeast. <laughs> mean by that is we've had some problems with our yeast lately. We don't know if they got baked in transit because the summer has been really hot, right? So we're going to do something a little different. We're going back in time, back to the old ways. You know, she actually spent like 20 minutes looking for the self-stirring cup. For those of you that know what that is, I thought it'd be just awesome to have that back. I think we actually got rid of it. Yeah, I think it's gone. I am using Cote de Blanc yeast because it's known for the fruity flavor thing in uh, wines, red and white wines, both. It, it's been a great performer for us. It's about 12 to 14%, so that's like perfect for what we're doing here today. And I have half a packet, like I said, I'm just gonna dump it into some plain old water, but still have to whack your packet, because if you don't, some of those yeast will never fulfill their destiny. And that's just a, a sh crying shame. I only have half a packet too, so I wanna get like every yeasty out of there. And wow, it's really stuck together. Right there. All right, that's good enough. And I just wanna, I'm hydrating them, okay? Yeah, there's stuff you can put in there if you really want to. I'm, I'm not gonna do that. We don't really need it today. Um, I just wanna make sure that those yeasts are alive. He's basically made a big mess. Yeah, that's what I do. But I happen to have the, the wuss, the whisk of unusually small size, so I can mix this up. For those of you that don't understand, if you hydrate your yeast first, it'll tell you if it's alive or dead. That's basically the gist. So that's and by what we're telling going. you, it's not going to go, "Hello, I'm alive." No, it's actually going to start foaming up. Well, of course, because they don't have mouths. Well, yeah, I know. I'm just trying to help out by how they tell you. Mm. They okay. illustrate. They show. They demonstrate. And then, because it's a blueberry wine, we need blueberries. And these are wild blueberries. For all of you guys that keep telling me to get wild blueberries, these are Costco wild blueberries. We usually use them. I may not have said that they were wild, but in many cases, they were. And why the wild blueberries? Because they're better. That's why they're better. Now, something really interesting that comes up often, people, are, people freak out when they start using fruit because they're like, oh, but it adds so much sugars. I actually figured this out. There's about 150 grams, grams of sugar in the whole bag of five pounds of blueberries. That is 15 points of gravity, literally 0 0.015 gravity. Almost not even worth worrying about. We will add it to our gravity when we get to that point, but until then, not going to worry about it much. But I'm going to dump these out. They are frozen still, sort of. And it's five pounds. Every blueberry is sacred. That, that's right. Got to get even the juices off the side. And, no, I'm not going to. Pack your packet. See, Back it's your universal. Bag. It's a bag now. All right. I'm not. That's going to be all nasty and sticky. <laughs> I think we got them. We're good. This is just a plain old pot, okay? I didn't sanitize it because we're going to be pasteurizing this entire batch. So what I want to do is grab some water. We have about three quarters of a gallon of water here because there's some liquid in the berries already. And we're gonna be making a roughly one and a half gallon batch. So I just wanna add enough water basically to cover, which is probably gonna be about half the water. Make a liar out of me, there we go. Okay, yeah, about half the water. Now, the trick is the less water you use, the easier it is to cool it down later. So we're gonna be heating this to 160 degrees Fahrenheit then take it off the heat because it only needs to be at that temperature for about a minute, but it's already been there, getting up to there, and that kind of thing. Then I'm gonna add that water back in and we have some sugar to add too, but I'll add the sugar once it comes off the heat. So essentially, here's what's gonna happen. This pot is gonna go over on the stove. I'm gonna heat it to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Celsius will be right in here somewhere. And once it comes to that temperature, take it off the heat. We'll be back at that point. I didn't think it was all that exciting to show you that part because it's gonna take a little while. 
All right, so this came up to 160 degrees, which let me explain why we do that, okay? The berries were frozen, which what that'll do is as they thaw, all those cell walls are ruptured, they're gonna fall apart. I mean, they basically did. As I, as I cooked this a little bit, they were just falling apart into juice. It's, it's like a blueberry soup right now in here. But heating it to 160 degrees pasteurizes it. That kills off any pathogens, organisms, whatever could have been in there, okay? So that's important. Could we have done it at 140 and just left it for like 20 minutes? Yes, you can totally do that. Pasteurization works at varying ranges. I just, you know, 160 from 140 only takes another minute or two, and that way it doesn't take longer to cook it. You know, that kind of thing. Anyway, and here's our yeast. Notice the lack of foam. It's dead. That yeast was no good. See, we would have had a stall. It never would have kicked up. So we grabbed another packet. We're going to try again. This is Premier Blanc this time. Um, you know, let me hold on a second. I was looking at it a little while ago. 13 to 15%, but can exceed 16% with a healthy ferment. So this might just go dry for us, which is totally fine. <sighs> but it's a non-terrible packet. I'm not going to complain about it anymore. It's just the way it is. I know, that fell on the floor, and that's just the way it is, too. So we're just going to dump that into our yeah, test solution, the because even though those other yeasts are dead, that doesn't mean they're going to cause any problems. No. Actually, they might act as food, kind because of a, yeasts kind of have cannibalistic tendencies. So. It'd be like a yeast nutrient-ish. Ish. Adjacent. It's like if you boil yeast and you use it as a nutrient, it's kind of like that. Not as good as an actual nutrient, but it, it does the job in a pinch. Um, speaking of a pinch, I also have over here some sugar that I'm gonna use in here, but I'm gonna take like half a spoon and put that in there with it. You don't wanna put too much in there because right. that could cause issues for your yeast as well, but you do wanna give them, you know, just a little bit. So if they're hungry, you know, they can have some to chew on. And I'm just gonna mix this through to fully hydrate them. Should know in just a few minutes. If it, it gets frothy, basically, is what happens. You know, you're looking for frothiness. Without the frothiness, they're dead. Can you tell I'm a little agitated about the yeast situation? We have probably 20 packs of yeast that might be dead. So we just have to figure it out as we go. But so. this does answer some of our questions of previous brews that acted a little mm -hmm. unusual, we probably just had some super stressed, not healthy yeast. It's possible. Okay, since this is still hot and it's right in front of me, I have here two pounds of sugar minus half of a spoon. I'm gonna dump it right in. There's a good reason for that. I calculated the amount of sugars in here. So I already know that in a gallon, it's gonna be 0 0.015. Well, one pound of sugar in a gallon of must adds 0 0.046. So two pounds would be 0 0.094, yeah. So 0 0.094 plus 0 0.015 is only gonna give me 1.109, which is right within our range of target gravity. Totally fine, might even be a little bit lower than that simply because of the volumes that we're working with. So I'm just gonna dump this in. It looks like a lot of sugar, but guess what? The yeast are gonna consume that. It, this, this shouldn't end sweet. This should actually end dry tasting and be somewhere around 13 to 14% alcohol. Should be. Now, when we're calculating these numbers of gravities in a must, it's always in a US gallon because we are US based and that's what we have available to us. Yeah. Also, it is those amounts of sugars in a gallon of must, right. not in an addition to a gallon of water. Remember I said I, I'm using about three quarters of a gallon of water. I'm estimating slightly because I know that there's some liquid already in the berries that's gonna come out. So right. we'll end up with more than a gallon. And so that's a common question that we get on the channel where it gets confused that it's, oh, it's that much sugar plus a gallon of water. Right, no. you'll actually end up with a little lower gravity if you do it yeah. plus a gallon of water. It's not a huge deal, but it is just something to be aware of. Yeah. Now I just wanna to stir to combine. I'm a little leery of adding too much liquid to this because I know that this is a two gallon pot. And right now it looks to be a little over half full, just, just slightly, which means there's already more than a gallon in here. If I add the other half gallon of water that I have sitting over there, I'm probably going to be larger than our little big mouth bubbler, which is 1.4 gallons. So I'm scared. <laughs> so I'm probably just gonna let this cool a bit before I add it in. 
but some other things that I want to add. Okay, let's, ooh, you know what? I Wait. think this yeast might be alive. Are we foamy? It's okay. getting foamy. I mean, I I did foam it up when it, in the mixing process too. Right. Needs about five, 10 minutes. Okay, anyway, to add some tannic quality. What I mean by that is like a mouthfeel, a little bit of a, makes you pucker just a, a little bit. There's some tartness in these berries, but tartness and tannins aren't the same. They don't come across exactly the same in mouthfeel, but they do have some crossover similarities. But we also used whole berries, so we do have the skins of the blueberries in yep. there. That's going to give us a little bit of tannin, but we want to add some additional just to make sure we got enough in there to create the texture, the profile that we're looking for. I'm expecting this to be a sweet wine that has a nice body at the end. So that's what we're going for. Sweet and a nice body, you know, just what every person's looking for. <laughs> anyway, so I used one black tea bag. The type of black tea bag does not matter, so long as it's just a plain black tea bag. Can you use Earl Grey? Sure, if you want your blueberry wine to taste like bergamot. Can you use a spice tea? Sure, if you want your blueberry wine to taste like spice tea. However, I just want to say something. This is one cup of tea, one tea bag, in an entire gallon. It is not going to flavor this in any meaningful way. You will not know there's tea in it, but it will add tannins. That tannic property will be there. This is one cup. Now, the amount of water that I use here really is immaterial because I'm gonna be diluting it into a gallon anyway, but I did steep it in a cup of water for five minutes, the recommended time. You looked like you wanted to say something. You have options here when it comes to tannin additives. Today we're using black tea, but if you have availability to a commercially made wine tannin, you can go ahead and use that as well. Just follow the manufacturer's directions. And before someone asked me why I didn't use a wine tannin and why I use tea instead, because in other videos we've used wine tannin, because I felt like changing it up. That's the honest answer. We did a test on it and there's virtually no difference. For this one, I didn't think we needed as pronounced of a tannin flavor, and I thought that the wine tannin gave just the tiniest of edge. Is it really that noticeable? Probably not. But I figured since there's already some tannins in the blueberries, and we haven't done it this way in a while, let's do something just a little different. Make we, it simpler. We also have a surplus of black tea. <laughs> yeah, lots. I'm going to check the temperature of this. You do not want to pitch yeast over 110 degrees Fahrenheit or so. I have a feeling it's still way above Yeah, that. it's looking hot. 135, yeah, it's it's still quite warm. Can you just dunk that into turbos? Not, sure not, not the whole thing, just, just the, the, the probe. Just the tip? Just remember who said that, it wasn't me. Uh, some other stuff that can go in this at this point is our yeast nutrient. Now, I know we're gonna have a little bit extra yeast nutrient in our yeast itself, just because some of them are dead. But, you know, I have started using 10 grams of Fermate O in every batch, except ciders, low ABV stuff, we don't really. But 10 grams seems to work really, really well. Careful, you're- Oh, am I slobbering it all over the place? getting a little carried away. Because I'm not looking. Yeah. Uh, so this is 10 grams of Fermate O in a little bit of water. Don't worry if it doesn't completely dissolve, it will. This is still quite warm. Whoop, got a blueberry in there. <laughs> I'm putting in all the things that I can put in that heat does not hurt. That's that's the gist here. Um, it's actually not far off the desired temperature. Let me have some of that water. I'm just gonna put some in. I'm gonna be careful. Because if I know this is just slightly over a gallon, I can put a little bit of this water in. That much. And that should cool it a bit. Does heat affect a pH reading? That's a very good question. I'm hesitant to answer at this moment in time. I don't think so, though. It, I mean, it won't affect it much. Are you saying we should do that now? I, just figured I was gonna take the pH once we got it to the dilution rate that we were gonna be sure. at, because that could change it. Um, and we might be there for all I know. And I know someone's gonna ask too, and this is a perfectly valid question. Um, could I use a bag? Of course you can. Uh, I prefer not to use brew bags because generally speaking, they just get in the way. We also know that we're gonna be using a little big mouth bubbler, and this here is the lid to that. And let me show you something. Let me show you its features. Let me show you its features. So this is the underside of the little big mouth bubbler lid. And as you see, it has this indent uh, 
flat surface. So when this is on the fermenter, and if you have something in a bag in that fermenter, it's gonna fill up with gas and it's gonna push up against this area. And because it's flat, it's gonna push flat against that area, thus clogging this area where this gas is going to escape through your airlock, thus preventing any gas from escaping, causing some serious issues. You know, like, boom. So we, we've, we've had multiple messes dealing with the bag, particularly in the little big mouth bubbler. So we're like, you know what? I'm, I'm good with dealing with the mess with the auto siphon rather than dealing with the mess up front with the, the, the bag yeah. and this. Usually what happens is you might get a little bit more loss if you don't use a bag, but not really, because yeah. you can just go a little deeper into there, rack it one more time, which in theory, then you do get a little bit more loss just because of racking more, but I don't know. We rack twice anyway, yeah, so. Yeah, it's never really us, that much of an issue. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt the video, but I wanted to tell you about the City Setting VIP Club. It's a super friendly bunch of brewers who get together and constantly help each other and share information. A large part of it is our private Facebook group where you can ask questions and get help. We also have Zoom meetings monthly for most tiers of membership. These hangouts are a great way to ask questions or just hang out with us and the other members. In addition, the higher tiers get their names right in our videos. So consider becoming a VIP. Now back to the video. Our yeast is alive though. Let me show you what living yeast in here look like today. Okay, I'm gonna risk it. We're at like 120, 122 degrees Fahrenheit. I We're know. We're tired of waiting. Yeah. It's been like half an hour, you know, just sitting here. So this has been sanitized. That's why it's upside down. Cause I was trying to drain out the last little bit of sanitization liquid. I, I have a bit of a quandary though. I'm probably gonna have to use a ladle. Yeah. Let me get a ladle. Yeah. So now the ladle is going to go into turbos. It's an all stainless steel ladle. Shouldn't be a problem. The other reason why I didn't want to put this in sooner is because of thermal shock. This is just glass, okay? If it, it, if it's too hot when you put it in, it's very likely to shatter that glass. So also putting it in with a ladle slowly, I probably won't shock it anywhere near as much. And it really doesn't matter if I get some air in there now because you want to aerate in the early stages anyway. So, but I do want to get it all into the fermenter, which is going to be difficult. Look away, look away. <laughs> it's also going to take a while. So see you when I'm done. Okay, I hate ladling, it's annoying. So I'm more than halfway through now. Yeah, I actually tipped that a little bit. We're just going to dump it in and hope I don't splatter her with blueberry juice. It's splattering everywhere. <laughs> it's so annoying. All right, I have to stand up to do this. All right, Santa's high spoonula. There's just some last bits and remnants. I paid for these blueberries. I want them in my wine. It's a joke, but it's sort of true. All right, that, that, that's good enough. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so it's... All in here now. It's pretty close to full. I'm going to just check the temperature one more time before I add yeast into this. Well, why don't we check the temperature and then do a pH reading before you add the yeast? Okay, we're still a little bit warm for temp. I'm going to add a little bit of water. I'm getting a little greedy here. Well, you're going to put all that in there too. Oh, what? All yeah, the yeast water. Right. But this will drop it a few degrees. And then this is only, you know, it's like a cup. It's not that much. Give me the pH reading thing, meter sure. stuff. <laughs> Words. <laughs> As we've started doing recently, I'm going to take a pH reading and I'm just going to take our pH meter and stick it right in here. And what I'm looking for is something in the range that that yeast can handle, which we can look that up and find out exactly what that yeast can handle. Okay, we are at 3.4 pH. So we're very, very close to ideal, depending on who you ask, okay? There are a lot of people that say they want over five. We've not seen any yeast say that. I just tried looking up Premier Blanc's pH range and I couldn't find anything. Like literally, it's really hard to find some of this information. I did find out though that yeast will not produce anything below 2.8 and the ideal is between three and 5.5. So somewhere in that range, is where you want. We were at 3.4, by the way, so we're good. 
As I add a little bit more water, it's probably gonna be just a touch higher than that, so we're fine. I do not want this to be over 110 degrees when I pitch the yeast, though. We're at 115. At 120, yeast die. That's why it's kind of an important thing. And you know, it's not like it's a hard number. At 119.9, they're fine, and 120, they're dead. It, you know, there's a range. So it's better to wait now than to rush things and have to repitch yeast again. Yeah. So I'm just gonna shut off the camera and we're gonna wait a little bit. Okay. It's cooled as much as I can deal with it. It's like 112 degrees. It's close enough. If you know, we, we're gonna look into a way to cool these things down a little bit faster. Our sink was occupied today, so we couldn't use it for that. Um, it was occupied for other things, you know. So gonna come up with something. I will come up with something. If anybody has good suggestions, like instant devices or quick stuff. Inexpensive, uh, please. Yeah, stuff that we can promote to other people too. Um, we're looking for a simple way to cool it down without getting out like the whole the copper tubing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'll figure something out. But anyway, so here we have our must. Here we have our yeast. You missed the foam dome, as it's, Derek it's called it. It's starting to build a new one. It was like up to here. It was, <laughs> and then it just burst. So anyway, our yeast is good. So that that's the important thing. The bit about the temperature is this. 120 degrees kills yeast. I think I said that already, but it's worth repeating. So we're at like 112. Should be just fine. I'm really not too worried about it. Um, so I'm going to add our yeast mixture in, and I'm going to scoop out every last one. This is this is the liquid equivalent of thwacking your packet. <laughs> and the reason why I'm doing this before taking my reading is because I'm adding liquid. So it'll alter the reading slightly. I wanted to uh, be as close to accurate as I could be. I'm just going to mix that through. Do you want any more water or are you good with your... I'm afraid to put more water in okay. here, to be honest, because it, it could foam up really, really bad and I don't I don't want to have, you know, foam everywhere. <laughs> that sounded very awkward, but... Okay, so now I'm going to take a gravity reading. And I know that I have five pounds of berries in here, which are going to add about 15 points, assuming they do everything out of them. So that's going to be our maximum... Um, so we'll see how I estimate that. Because some of the sugars will have come out. Whoops. If you push it to the head, yeah. Oh, yeah? Well, you're going to... There's berries all through this. Everywhere. Here. Whoa. I got an idea. I swear that was the baster. But it worked more, more or less. He'd like to think so. The berries just keep getting sucked up. Okay, I got an idea. You want the, the strainer? I, I got an idea. I'll be right back. What we have here is a coffee or a tea strainer. We're just going to dunk that in sanitizer. These are the uh, reusable gold mesh tea strainers. I'll make sure to link these in the description below because if you are fans of hoity-toity tea like we are and you get the loose tea, these are perfect and they're reusable. And they're really not expensive. All right, so we're going to use this as our berry barrier. Ooh, listen to you. All the fancy names. And now I can just go right in there and get the juice just like that. Almost it's like we planned it. Beautiful. That is a gorgeous color. If it retains half this color in the final wine, it'll be gorgeous. But now I got no solids coming up here or anything like that, so it's pretty easy. And I think that's all I really need. We're floating. We're floating. Okay, so our actual reading is 1.082. Now I'm going to estimate that some of the sugars came out and we're probably not going to get all the sugars out of the blueberries to convert and everything like that. So let's just add like 10 points. It's total estimation and that's totally okay because if we're within a couple points of the ABV, I'm happy. So I'm going to call it 1.092. That can give us somewhere around a 13% or so ABV at the end. Works for me. But for now, I'm going to take this back out, get every last drop, and I'm going to dump our sample back in. Okay, so what do we got to do now? We got to put this lid and airlock on here. Yes. Catch the threads and spend the next 20 minutes of your life turning it. And then crank it down real good. That way it gets a good seal. Ta-da! And then I'm just going to turn it because I have OCD about where the airlock sits and everything. Make sure and, everything's dry. And, oh, we need tape. And off camera, we're probably going to put tape on this and stick it on here. And then we're going to put this on a tray with like... A edges. lip, edges, just in case it gets happy and overflows. 
because it's it's up there pretty good. Okay, I'll be honest. It's it's pretty close. It could come up and make a mess. If it does, I may take the airlock out and put a piece of silicone tubing in, run it to a mason jar of water or something for the first couple of days. Also, um, known as a blow-off tube. Yeah. It just helps to uh, relieve the pressure a little bit better while it's really active in the beginning. And we'll be back to show you what this looks like once it's calmed down and it looks like it might be close to being done. So it's been 12 days on the blueberry wine and um, it looks like the airlock has leveled out completely. So we're gonna take the lid off and give it its first check. It's on there good too. We gotta take a look at our fruit cap. Yep. Okay, it's a little bit on the drier side. However, there's nothing wrong there's, going on in there. Right. Let me uh, let me show you. So as you can see, there's the all the blueberries at the top. It's a little drier than I really would like, but they are still technically moist. But we did have a nice CO2 blanket in there, which probably prevented anything from happening like mildew or mold or that kind of thing. So we're going to do our trick where we take our reading by pushing the end of our baster to where we can see it. So our fruit cap is pretty dense. It's about that thick. This is the first reading, correct? Yes. Okay, because I have to do a little bit of a blowout at the end to make yeah. sure no blueberries get in there. So yeah. I'm going to depress the bulb about halfway and then at the end get that. So I'm just going to go down here. So let's go down like in there, yeah. And I know somebody's going to give me a hard time because I'm oxidizing. The amount of oxygen I just put in, it's really not anything to worry about. People get crazy about oxidizing. Is it a serious thing? Well, yeah, it is. However, it's not, it's not as crazy as people think it is. Like we hear people with sanitization doing like they put plastic wrap up to cover their walls and stuff and wear labs. No, you don't need to do that. Just be reasonable. Look at the color. Oh, wow, that's amazing. And I think this is dry, which is what we we're hoping for. By the way, the little squeeze out at the end, it's just a tiny amount. That is literally meant just to- Dislodge any blueberries. Dislodge blueberries, like the one that I got in there now. Wow, that color is incredible. If it keeps half that color, I'll be thrilled. That is super dry. Uh, yeah. Like almost half the dirt dry. Okay, we have we have a first. <laughs> this is 0.986. Bang! I guess the yeasties like the, the blueberries. Well, we also have been using the new version of, of Fermaid O, like oh, more Fermaid right, O. Right, right. They are really liking that. The wild blueberries seem to have a lot of nutrients in them. And then the Fermaid O and a good, a good yeast we used. Um, you were the one who scratched that out. So I think, I don't I know. I scratched out Cote, the Cote de. Premier Blanc. Oh, that's what it is. It's Premier Blanc, Premier Blanc. not Cote de Blanc. That's yeah. why I scratched it out. Yeah. Um, you know, you use a good yeast. It happens. So let's see. Using the calculator, the teacher said I would never have. I have to keep making the joke because somebody got offended that I said others were offended that I made the joke. So they didn't want me to make the joke anymore. But when I didn't make the joke, somebody got offended that I didn't make the joke because they didn't want me to get offended by somebody that got offended. Yeah. Welcome to being a YouTuber. <laughs> so we're at 1.092. And I'm not, I'm just joking. I'm not saying I have to make the joke. We I, started I at 1.092. Yeah, 1.092. We're currently at 0.986. Minus 0.986. You heard that right, 0.986. That is 106 points or 0.106 used times 135. Gives me 14.3% ABV. So um, let's just call it 14%. Nice round number. All right. That's impressive. So normally we would wait a week and check this again. I don't like the way that fruit is sitting. I don't either. I don't want to mix it all up again and, and wait a week to get. I can't. Is it really going to go below 0.986? I, I mean, I, come I, on. I'd be shocked. So let's wrap this now. Yeah, let's wrap now. this. Yep. What fermentation device should we put this into? I knew you were going to ask me that and I'm not ready to answer. I'm going to go with a wide mouth though. Unless, do we want to rack to a pitcher and then whack to it? Or do no, we to I don't like doing that. Too much chance of oxidizing. Sure. Okay. Um, Ow. But, <sighs> see, okay. Let me explain what we're thinking about now. <laughs> right now we have this much headspace. This is a 1.4 gallon container that holds 1.5 gallons up to here. So we have berries down to here. About half of that is going to be juice. So we have juice up to about here. And it is so dark. It's so dark. It's hard to we tell how much we have at the bottom. Releases. You know what? Closed mouth. Let's go with a narrow mouth container. Okay. Uh, no, we can't. We were going to oak this. We oak with two question marks. 
I oh, see. And we don't know. Questions, so concerns. So many variables. So you know what I'm thinking? Why don't we take a taste of the sample oh. and make a determination? Let's do that. Let me get a glass. Okay, so I'm just gonna take some of our sample. It's very dry. I do not expect this to taste amazing. It smells astringent and fruity. Actually, you know what it smells like? It smells like a really good dry red wine. Yes, it does. Very much like a grape red wine. It's amazing. Ooh, I'm going in. All right. Whoa, she didn't even make a face. That is fantastic. That is so good. I don't even know if I want to sweeten this one. Now, here is a fun fact. I don't know if you can see, you can't see the top, but on our top shelf, we have a container that is actually our anniversary wine. And was it like Boone's or something? <laughs> no, it's a blueberry wine. Oh, okay. There is a local, local vineyard uh, that makes their own blueberry wine. They grow their own blueberries and they make their own blueberry wine and that's what's in there. That's right, we did the thing at our wedding where yep. we have that. So we've yep. had that for uh, 13 years. Yeah, we were supposed to open it on our first year and then we didn't and then it just it just keeps building. So it's still there. So we're going there. for like 20. Yeah, sure. Maybe we'll open it on camera in 20 years. Who knows? Um, but. I kind of want to taste that and compare it right now, but I don't because that's the anniversary one. It's special. Um, My thinking. This this is this is like got me off the rails again, and that seems to be the the whole. We've been doing that a lot. It's this year. This year is the off the rails year. Well, I think we're we're expanding to a lot of different ideas that we never really thought about before. We've taken it from a very very simple table wine operation to a little bit more complex, a little bit more um, you know uppity. Sure, Hoity, sure. If you will, um, wines and meads. So and it, it, it's fine. We also know from the comments that we get a lot of people have some very deep seated pre premeditated, precognitive, whatever notions of what wine should and should not be. Oh yeah, somebody out there has already written in the comments that this isn't wine because it's not made with grapes. And. There are times when I can see their point of view and go, okay, some of the fruit wines are so borderline wine profile that, can you be angsty and say that's not really a wine? Sure, but then what is it? Is it Fred? Because I mean, come on. Right, it's uh, Steve. This, however. We'll call it George. Is so much wine. It's like more wine than our table grape wine. Yeah. This is, this is a beautiful wine. I don't need sweetness. I don't need oaking. I don't need anything. Are I you think, sure? I think this is perfect I just wanna, the way it is. I'd, I'd like to oak it. But with that said, you can go from this and go into different directions. Let me just say two words. French oak. Right. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to keep this dry. We're going to <laughs> rack it. Maybe we'll do half dry, half sweet. Okay. What are your thoughts? Right now, I agree with you. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is compromise. All right, so let's get to racking, uh, and we're back to a wide mouth we now. We have to do a wide mouth if we're gonna, if we're gonna put oak. oak yeah. Right. Okay, so let me go dig out some wood. Yeah, and we're gonna <laughs> rack this to a pitcher, or to a container, fermenter, yeah, thing, and we'll be back. All right, so we're back. I actually found a virgin wide mouth fermenter. None of this stuff has been used before. I didn't even think we had any of those left in our supplies. We just randomly buy stuff when we see them at good prices and apparently we hadn't used it yet. I did pull out some sherry cask French oak that I thought might be nice. The sherry cask might add a nice uh, extra sweetness to this. The vanillins from the French oak. I mean, smell that. It's yeah. just amazing. That's and amazing. where do we get our wood from? We get our wood from Barrel Char Products. Wood products, yeah. We will put a link in the description below. It's As an Etsy always, store. all of the stuff that we use, we always try to find links and put them in the description. So that way you can purchase them if you wish. A little bit of those proceeds go to help the channel because we are Amazon affiliates at no additional cost to you. So it's a win-win. 
Plus, some of this stuff is difficult to find, and we understand that. So that way, we do all the work, we do all the research, we find them for you, and you just click a button and you're good to go. Full disclosure, Barrel Char Wood Products, we don't actually have an affiliate program with. They do send us a lot of samples and new products whenever they make them, so they do send us these things, okay? I yeah. just have to be yeah. full disclosure on that. But uh, we recommend them because their stuff is awesome. Right. We have used other wood products, and we have not found them to be even remotely as good no. as barrel char. Plus, Ken is really good. If you ask him a question, he'll help you. He'll, yeah. he'll say, and like, if you say, I'm making this thing, he'll tell you what to, what to use. And if you say, City Sitting told me to, you know, City Sitting told me to call you, he's probably gonna help you even more. Anyway, what I did here is I have about a cup, it doesn't really matter, of boiling water that I dropped that piece of wood into. And you see me just playing, ow, it's hot still. Yeah. And I'm just kind of dipping it in there. The idea is you want it to sit in there for about five to 10 minutes. It's probably been close to that. It pulls out some of the excess tannin and it also sanitizes that wood. We've had a problem before where I didn't sanitize it properly. It might have caused a problem. We're not 100% sure on that, but we think it did. So. So it's time to rack. First of yes. all, we're going to take our sample reading that Brian took and go ahead and put that into our destination vessel. So that way we don't disturb the chaos that is in our original fermentation vessel. Still can't believe this went to 0.98. That is shocking. In all my years of brewing, I've never seen that. I've heard of people getting low numbers like that. I've never seen it. Now, the question of why that can happen is because ethanol is actually a 0.079 specific gravity and water is 1.000. So if you have a mix, you're going to be lower than 1.000. Very simple. All right. So as always with racking, our destination vessel is going to go lower than our uh, source. source. That's the word. Words. <laughs> There's a lot of fruit in here. Yeah. I'm going to try to pull out as much as I can because I think this is going to be good. So I have the cap on the auto siphon and I'm gonna go pretty deep into the lees and I'm gonna let it keep going and see how much we can get out. It'll settle. This is our first rack. So we're probably gonna end up racking it again, uh, but I'd like to get as much as we can out of this one. All right, so we racked it. I was greedy. <laughs> it's like right to there. I'm actually concerned of the displacement of the piece of wood if we're gonna. No, I think it's just gonna float. It's fine. Ta-da! <laughs> this water, don't drink it, don't use it, put it on your plants maybe, that's about it. Oh, you can let it cool. Let it cool first. You can put it on a fire ant mound. Sure. Boil I don't them. know what that means, but... You boil them. You boil the fire ants and they It's die. not that hot. <laughs> All right. Anyway, All so right. let me take some notes. Yeah. What did we do? We racked and we added the sherry cast French oak. I marked that we racked. Thank you. Okay, what are we gonna do with it now? We're gonna let it sit, and we don't really know how long. At it least needs two to weeks. Sit. Yeah. At least two weeks. It might might be. I think two weeks is probably gonna be just right. This tasted really good. Um, I did say something about maybe do half sweetened, half not. I don't know yet. Um, we'll have to see when we get. Uh, we get there. And part of that is because we kind of had preconceived notions of where we wanted this to go and it decided to go someplace different, but where it went was actually really awesome. Yeah. So we're not going to fight it. We're going to go with it. Yep. So see in about two seconds. Okay. So it's been on sherry infused oak for one week. Let's uh, see. Just hold on to that, please. Don't set it down yet. We're just going to take a quick taste and see if that's enough. I have a feeling a week on the oak probably isn't going to do it. It hasn't been really that hot and we're temperature controlled because we keep this inside our house. Uh, and it's really, really full, so we can spare a little yeah. bit of the taste. What was our, this is a 14%-ish ABV. Yeah, this was 0 0.986 final gravity. It's very, very dry. That color is gorgeous. Yeah, it's a, I'm an amazing color. I'm so happy with that color. The smell on this is so rich, full-bodied. It's It's incredible. That comes across like such a great dry red wine. Mm. I don't think we need to sweeten this. But you know what I'd like to do? It needs more oak. And I think it needs a little bit of acid. A little bit of brightness. You think so? You don't? Let me have another taste. 
I'm, I'm getting a little bit of a muted flavor. There's a, yeah. No, maybe, 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 two sips. maybe I'm convincing or com confusing tartness with acidity. Well, they, they sort that, of work that I'm way. I'm getting that. Well, dryness and acidity are not necessarily the same. Sure, but I'm getting like the the fruity blueberry tartness, mm. like tart blueberries. Sometimes it's better to take more than one sip. Okay. When I let it sit for a while, you're right. It doesn't really need any acids. I'm not sure if there's enough oak on it. One week isn't really a lot, but I do detect it. It's definitely there. I'm afraid if we go more time on the oak that it might overtake the fruity flavor of the berry that's there, and then we'll end up having to sweeten it to overcome it. You see what I'm getting at? Like this is this is part of the experience part of homebrewing, knowing when to do what and what you want it to be. Yeah, this is sherry. Sherry infused yep. French oak. Yep. I can taste I'm the, sherry. the sherry. I can taste a I'm little bit of the vanillins. The vanillins. And yep. there's just enough tannic properties coming through. I'm afraid I, I another think, week is gonna be too much. I think we're done. Okay. All right. Well then I was I was with you initially, like yeah. you said, thinking it needed more time, but I'm definitely getting the sherry. I'm definitely getting the vanillins. Uh so I think we're done. She was wondering how I was gonna get that out of there. I didn't think that was that was the appropriate method, but what is the appropriate method? I don't know. You know, because you don't want to stick your hand in there at this point in the game. We had made sure all that was sanitized, so we're not contaminating our brew because this is really nice, and so we don't want to do that. I don't want to contaminate it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna do this tasting a little bit different because we got to give scores on this now. Yeah. Um, so we're just gonna share a glass. Be because all sharing is caring. Okay. First. On the color, Look color at and that clarity, color. it's beautiful. Oh it gosh. really is quite clear. It's just so dark it's that it's hard to see. It's super through. dark, but when you get to the edge, it's like this almost Wait, see that color? bright pinky, purpley. It's, oh, it's, it's amazing. It's you, blueberry color. You know who would appreciate the color? Sarah. Harley Quinn. Harley oh. Quinn. Okay. Maybe she would. I don't know. <laughs> I still have her within me, and she says, yes, that's a beautiful color. On the aroma, I get blueberry. Um, I get a little touch of the oak coming through. The sherry notes of the oak are coming through just a, just a little bit. Very fruity, oh, full-bodied. Yeah. Like, oh, it's just, yeah. it, it, it overcomes your senses. It's actually quite wonderful. I think one of the appealing parts of this is that typically, both Brian and I really appreciate a beverage is on the sweeter side of the spectrum. This is not sweet. This is super dry. This is... Yeah, this is the driest we've ever seen. Dry, Point, dry. 0.986. It's a dry, dry. But it has so much complexity and lovely aspects to it that not only are we not missing the sweetness, we're actually afraid of introducing sweetness because it may ruin what's going on. I need to point something out here. Today, this brew is 21 days old. It's exactly three weeks. There are no off flavors, no off smells, and this is dry. There's no way to mask anything here. This is amazingly good yeah, at and, three weeks. And this has a lot of the rich depth, complexity, and I know I've said that multiple times now already, and that you would anticipate to be in a a quality wine, yeah. like something that has been matured, and, matured yeah. and aged and generations of people growing the grapes and and the the mass rows of ancient casts and the, the taster going in and sampling each one and that kind of scenario. And we made this with blueberries. Yep, five pounds of blueberries. Frozen blueberries. And some sugar. Uh, some fermate o. And, and then we oaked it. On a repeatability scale, I'm going to say this is like a nine. Because the fact that it went so low, I don't expect that everybody's going to have it go that low. It could just, perfect situation, whatever. Also, anytime you add oak in, oak is kind of a wild card because yeah. there's so many variables that are going to change how much product. the oak is going to extract into your brew. So that's going to knock down the repeatability just simply because just of the complexity. 
So yeah. like eight to nine for repeatability. It shouldn't be too hard. Even a, a relative beginner could make this one. Yeah. yeah. Um, it does involve more steps than usual. You have to cook the blueberries, that kind of thing. But it, it came out wonderfully well. So the next is our bias score, our how much we like it, basically. Um, one through 10. One to 4.5 is usually like, eh, not really something I would want to drink so much. Five to 9.5 is pretty much amazing. And then I reserve 10s and 11s for, oh my God, this is good. I drank it all. I hope yeah, you had a no, number. Yeah, that's fine. I, I, I pretty much have a number. Now, a little bit of personal bias on this. I don't like dry white wines or meads generally, but I don't mind dry reds. So this does sort of fall into my wheelhouse and that's that's definitely working with me. This is one that I would have with food. Uh, absolutely. Put this with food. Absolutely. Put this with like a tomato sauce or something. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, it's so good. If, if I could with categorize food, this even. with just paired with food, my number is going to be significantly higher well, we can than, talk about it, than but, overall. But give us give your score of what you think of it, and then we can talk more. I'm, I'm giving my score based on just this experience yeah. right here, right alone. All right, are you ready? Yes. One, two, three, eight. eight. That says it, that's, that's really amazing. For eight. a 0 0.986 gravity, final finish, totally dry, eight is a solid score. Yes, from our point of view, eight is a solid good. Yeah. Yes, that is good. It's actually bordering great. Now, pair this with food, I'm giving it like a 10. It's way up there. A 10.5. Yeah. This, this will bring out flavors and foods and it- Oh yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're kind of flabbergasted because we weren't expecting this to be finished today. No. We were not expecting this to be a done deal. No. We really thought this was gonna go on a little more. It's three weeks old today and it's already that good. I can only imagine what the one year tasting is gonna be like. It's going oh, yeah. to be like, a 12. Yeah. It, it's it's going to be like, incredible. we have to move now so we can have a cellar <laughs> to put this in. Um, anything else you want to say on this? I, I don't think anything else needs to be said. This, this is fabulous. I'm so happy. We expected and to have to sweeten this one. From the day one, we expected this we to did, be We did, because we're like, blueberries. Blueberries are sweet, right? Well, in most cases, but if you make a really high-profile, complex mouth enriching, gorgeous yeah. color wine from it, then no, it doesn't have to be sweet. So go ahead and make this. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching and have a great day. Bye-bye.